For months now, millions of tons of grain have been stuck in Ukraine's ports because of the ongoing war, food that is desperately needed here in Africa. Given the war and the climate crisis, anything we can do to improve our own food supplies has got to be good. This is our focus today. So welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinovidio here in Kampala, Uganda. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah, the crisis is definitely affecting Africa. But in the next 30 minutes, we'll be looking at some innovative ways to grow food and live off your own produce. I am Chris Alems in Ogun State, Nigeria. Coming up. An example from Ghana, how vegetables can be grown even on a tiny plot of land. An example from Germany, how fish farms can flourish even in the city. And an example from Rwanda, how drones can make livestock farming safer and more profitable. How can we ensure food security in the face of the climate crisis? 95% of farms in Africa depend directly on rainfall. Drought and extreme weather regularly decimate the crops. So reducing that rain dependence is key, especially because the grain import that would normally make up for the shortfall are now blocked because of the war in Ukraine. One promising model is agroforestry. Farmers in Ivory Coast are rediscovering this traditional method of farming but they still have a long road ahead of them. Jerome Kasim Kasim inherited this plot of land from his grandfather. Several different tree species grow here, amongst the cocoa trees on his 1.7 hectares. It's a technique called agroforestry. Over there is the emian that I know is a good wood, as it's a wood that can do many things. I also know the akpi well. I don't really know the scientific names of the other trees, but I do know that they can protect my cocoa because they provide shade. Intensive monocultures of cocoa, rubber and oil palm have completely transformed Ivory Coast landscape. Over the last 50 years, the country has lost more than 80% of its forest cover and the intensive use of pesticides has considerably damaged the soil. Climatic disturbances add to these difficulties with intense heat and irregular rainfall that sweep away crops. Professor Tondo from a university in Abidjan believes that the country is in a state of emergency. The future of farmers is threatened. We analyze the percentage of degraded soil in the top 20 centimeters. This percentage is enormous. We need to make a fairly serious diagnosis, a multidisciplinary diagnosis which takes into account the biophysical aspect, the socioeconomic aspect, and then arrive at a sustainable soil restoration plan. Women cassava growers in the village of Bassazin have decided to experiment with establishing woodlots with the help of a local NGO. Plots in a cassava field must be replaced each year, but diseases are multiplying due to soil impoverishment and global warming. That's why the women are now looking for new fertile plots in the few remaining forests. The woodlots allow them to have healthy cassava plants to grow in the same field each year. The women are satisfied with the harvest. Today, a single hectare of cuttings can produce 20 to 40 tons of cassava, compared to 15 tons at most previously. For the north, in Yamusukro, another player wants to help to accelerate sustainable farming methods. The European Institute for Cooperation and Development provides training. On the plan, mineral fertilization of the soil, biocompost, or the use of different pesticides. Producers usually use the mineral fertilizer that we sell here, MP4. Via the agroecological transition project, we want to help them change their practices and move towards organic fertilizer 
organic matter. A converge vers l'engrais organique, la matière organique. The training has already produced results. Frank Elvis Kwasi Nunman is one of the farmers who's taken part in the training program. For the past two years, he's used his own system for producing organic compost. He mixes waste from his chickens with wild grasses and ash. He then uses this fertilizer on his vegetable crops. Using this method has enabled him to halve his production costs. The blackness of the soil can tell us that we have good soil for farming. We can also see how earthworms are starting to recolonize the plots. So it's encouraging and it doesn't cost me too much. 250 farmers have already been trained over the last three years. They should be able to transform Ivory Coast agriculture into a more sustainable one in the long run. Can you grow food in the heart of a major city at a time when supply chain disruptions and high energy prices are driving up food prices? People are starting to worry. And this is why some are hoping that communal gardens, hydroponic farms and aquaculture facilities can help cities fed. A young company in Berlin is bringing together two radically different types of cultivation which could be a boon for urban farming. Feeding time at a fish farm in Berlin. Perch naturally swarm in schools but do need a bit of space. These specimens seem to be doing okay and their owners are committed to using no medication. The fish spend seven months growing into adults at a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius. The 13 tanks are filled with rainwater, with the company only resorting to Berlin tap water in dry months. The perch have been on a vegetarian diet for the past month. Their new feed contains no fish meal or fish oil, but wheat, corn and soybeans. The primary concern for the company Eco-Friendly Fish is what comes out the other end, as it were. The aqua in aquaponics stands for aquaculture and the ponic for hydroponics, which refers to plants grown without any soil. So combining the two involves having fish, feeding them and using their excrement as fertilizer for plants. And as it's a circular system, the water flows from fish to plant and back again. The urban farm produces five tons of fish and half a million pots of basil a year. Bacteria break down the ammonium in fish poop into nitrates, which then serve as fertilizer. The plants in turn convert the carbon dioxide exhaled by animals into oxygen. The farm gets its power from a local green electricity provider. 220 liters of water are sufficient to produce one kilo of fish and one and a half kilos of vegetables. According to the World Wildlife Fund, farming the two separately requires up to 1,000 liters of water. We were growing all kinds of things here, eggplants, bell peppers, tomatoes and cucumbers, and herbs and lettuce as well, of course. And it was after meeting a grocery retailer that the idea came up, why not just sell our products at their stores in Berlin? Every Thursday, the purveyors of Berlin Hauptstadt Barsch, or Capital Perch, add up their online orders and then harvest the fish according to demand. It's not as if I have some personal attachment to each individual fish. It's nice when they look good and are healthy and have a decent size. And if they taste good too. Shoppers can log on to the city's Marktschwärmer or Food Assembly website. After choosing a product and local producer, they can also choose where to pick up their order. The setup helps reduce road travel and emissions. For a lot of small-scale farmers from the Berlin region, it's the sole option for getting their goods directly to customers. 
Today, Susanne de Rose is hosting a pop-up food assembly store. The once-a-week operation earns her an 8.3% take-off turnover. The food assembly network Marktschwärmer in Germany has now spread across the country. Berlin alone has 29 of these pop-up outlets. I do all the organizing. It's good for the neighborhood and for the producers. And it matters a lot to me because of the problem we have with industrial farming, where sustainability is not guaranteed. There's not only fruit and veg for sale, but also flowers, meat and dairy products, depending on what's currently in season. Then customers from the neighborhood have a couple of hours to come along and pick up their online orders and sometimes stay for a chat. Once the final fish has been sold, the store closes its doors until the same time the following week. The eco-friendly fish farm shows how fish and basil can be produced in parallel. The team are now selling their aquaponics expertise to other farms elsewhere in Europe and perhaps the idea will become a burgeoning business around the world. It is amazing what is possible in the middle of a major city. But for now, let us get back to Africa. More than 50% of people here are involved in agriculture. Most of them do not have giant fields to work with. They plant their crops in their gardens around their homes. That's right, Sandra. You just need to know how to do it right. Then you can find room even in the smallest lot. An initiative in Ghana teaches people how to cultivate their own tomatoes, onions and pepper. And it's important information because climate change is forcing many people to leave agriculture. A crowd of women is gathering to get some gardening tips. Growing fresh produce isn't hard and the benefits are enormous. Here in northern Ghana, Alberta Akosa and her team are showing local women how best to create a backyard vegetable garden. The small organization started out as a social media project. So we are all planting together. And soon gathered momentum, attracting a growing number of female followers. We had seats at our office. We had some small garden tools. So we started advocating, uh, putting on social media that if you want to a backyard garden, just contact us. And uh, it was, unless I don't want to use the word crazy, it was crazy, a crazy week for us. Within a week, 700 volunteers signed up for the One Household, One Garden program. During the pandemic, food prices rose dramatically and many people decided to go back to growing their own vegetables. Alberta Acosta has seen how working with women can positively impact entire communities. Anytime we support women, we realize that there's a multiplication. We've over the years supported uh, women farmers, women processors, uh, women marketers, uh, widows who are also into farming, uh, pregnant women and uh, single mothers. And we realize that it's extended beyond their uh, family to their communities, changing uh, livelihoods and being an inspiration and serving as mentors even within their communities. Once they complete training, the women are awarded seeds and a pair of rubber boots. They'll be going home to plant tomatoes, onions and peppers. If their vegetable patches flourish, they'll even have enough produce to sell. What I've learned here will benefit me a lot. I can make some money with what we've been trained to do. It will also help mothers feed their children after every harvest. This could be very good business for me. In recent years, food prices have doubled even at local markets. The coronavirus crisis has caused ongoing supply chain problems. Alberta Acosta is keen to make agriculture a more stable sector. She believes that a lot more locally grown produce could be sold at local markets. Ghana is a fertile country that's rich in resources. It's quite expensive and the fact that you are not, you are not even seeing 
anyone from Ghana, all is from Cote d'Ivoire. So, like, you are looking at transportation costs here and all that's going into it. Now 41, Alberta Acosta heads the organization. She originally wanted to be a journalist. Now she's an activist traveling across the country with her team. In the last five years, they've trained up some 26,000 women. I was more into uh, consultancy when I started my career. I ended up having a path which uh, made me more fulfilled, and that is traveling across the, uh, the country, uh, dialoguing, uh, dining, with women farmers, with smallholder farmers, and seeing what I can do in my own small way to support. Agriculture in Ghana is a struggling sector. A growing number of farmers are giving up. The driving principle behind the AgriHouse Foundation is that cultivating vegetables should be profitable. The project also promotes healthy eating. It has the support of local governments. And overall, it also raised the consciousness of uh, people's awareness in seeking to make their environments cleaner by having those uh, gardens. So it is a concept that, uh, for me, is a, a holistic in terms of getting the right nutrition, getting the environment clean, and more importantly, also generating people's interest in uh, practicing agriculture at that uh, level. Alberta Acosta follows up on her training courses, visiting participants years later to see how they are getting on. Okay. The idea is that they plant gardens that are sustainable. The experts give tips on how to get the most out of a small space. Okay. I wish that I extend my garden to be able to feed some of my neighbors around, not only my family. Because if I have more, people around me can also benefit from it. So that's what I'm hoping for. Seeing women learn to take pride in their achievements is what drives Akosa. Today, she's just shown over 100 women how to be more self-sufficient. And now for everyone who's fortunate enough to have such a wonderful garden, we have a tip from Senegal. When you use locally produced organic fertilizer, growing tasty and healthy food can be sustainable too. Our Doing Your Bits installment this week shows you how one inventor figured out a way to do just that. Most households produce a fair amount of organic waste every day. And that can be used to produce fertilizer for flower or vegetable gardens. When Nadia Chingon couldn't find a composter in Senegal's capital, Dakar, she decided to make her own. Her team turned standard metal barrels into simple but effective composters. Holes in the sides and top help to aerate the kitchen or garden waste and speed up the composting process. They'll also allow earthworms and insects to get inside and help break down the organic matter. A small door cut at the base makes soil removal easy. After adding a coat of paint, the composter is ready. They can be produced in several sizes. Over the past year, the team made about 200 units. All you need is a container. The climate in Senegal is perfect for compost. With the humidity, there's no need to do anything. It transforms on its own. That's how we came up with the idea. Any vegetable or fruit scrap can be added, as well as bread, pasta, tea leaves, coffee, and nut and eggshells. When mixed together, the organic waste breaks down naturally into a nutrient-rich compost. It takes about a month for the garbage to transform into fertilizer, which can be used for anything from plants in pots or boxes to papaya or orange trees. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. In Rwanda, the government hopes to provide 100% of its population with secure access to food by 2030. 
At the moment, the number is only around 80%. That is very true, Chris, but Rwanda has realized that new technology like solar-powered irrigation schemes and local seed production can help to improve the situation. Now, recently, they have also launched a project for the livestock farmers where new technologies are making their work faster, easier and more sustainable. This drone is taking to the skies as part of an unusual delivery service transporting fresh semen to be used for artificial insemination on pig farms. It's headed for a 30-minute flight to the village of Rubona. Pig semen used for artificial insemination must be stored under special conditions. When we transported it by road to remote locations, it often spoiled along the way. The drone is much faster, so the semen is still in good condition for insemination. Rising incomes and a growing middle class have increased domestic demand for meat products. The pig farming sector has expanded by more than 70% in recent years. But often the young animals aren't as healthy as they could be. A special government artificial insemination program is now ensuring that the semen is taken from robust males and that sows don't pick up diseases from bulls during breeding. Fabrice Ndaisenga says it also provides jobs for local communities. To feed our population or to increase the, the required quantity of meat, we have seen that uh, pig industry and the poultry, poultry industry uh, will, be, will be the champions. So with all those innovations, we are thinking that once farmers are using the, the required the required technology, the required breeds, it will help to, to boost, to increase the, the production of meat. Rwanda teamed up with an American company a few months ago to launch the initiative. The drones can fly up to two hours at a time and carry loads of up to 1.8 kilos. They navigate with the help of GPS satellite data, so they're both fast and accurate. The swine semen orders are prepared for delivery right at the flight center. The temperature of the semen is maintained within plus or minus two degrees Celsius for the duration of the flight. During the program's pilot phase, the government is covering the transportation costs. They have the number of our center, have technicians. They are, they know now we are, we are, Informing farmers, they have their groups on WhatsApp. They know when they can they can call. They have the number of technicians on the center. Wherever they are across the country, we deliver we deliver the quantity required. They're already waiting at the health center in Rubona. Exactly on time, the drone drops the package at its destination. Time is now of the essence. The semen is prepared and the sow artificially inseminated. From its start in the capital Kigali to insemination, the entire process took just one hour. Pig breeder Fistin Mohiri is taking part in the program for the first time. The reason I chose to use drone-delivered semen is that I can be sure that it's good quality and that I can choose the breed I want. Also, I don't have to move my animals, which is time-consuming and expensive. Anastasia Uwimabera has been taking part in the program from the start. Her 300 sows have already borne more than 60 piglets. Now that we've seen that this method is successful, I'll get rid of the male pigs, the boars. It costs me a lot of money to take care of them and feed them. Now I'll be able to eliminate those costs. For me, this artificial insemination program is a successful initiative. Rwanda sees the drone program as a long-term investment. In addition to pig semen, the drones also transport urgently needed medications and vaccines across the country. 
Wow, that really is amazingly efficient. That is all for this week's edition of Eco Africa with a special focus on food security. It is time for me to bid you farewell from Kampala here in Uganda. I am Sandra Twinovdio and I will be seeing you very soon next week. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks for watching to our viewers. Drop us a line and tell us what you liked about our show or check out Echo Africa on social media channels. For now, I'm Chris Alems, signing off from Ogun State in Nigeria. Uh -oh.